So uh, Jay Young is one of uh, the, uh, is an expert on uh, oil and natural gas, uh, energy. Uh, you can hear him on TV nonstop and radio. Uh, he also has a podcast that's very popular um, in the space. And uh, I, I think that he did three TV appearances yesterday. Uh, so we're talking about oil and natural gas, the pickle the United States has gotten itself into uh, in energy uh, and uh, ways to dig ourselves out of it in almost a literal way. So um, Jay, can you, are we, somebody else logged in? Great. Uh, uh, Jay, so can you do introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks Marty, I appreciate that. Yeah, my name is Jay Young, King Operating in Dallas, Texas. We're an operator of oil and gas. We are, we're an expert trying to try to be an expert, trying to be the best we can. And, and no guarantees in this world, obviously, but you know, my family's been in the business since 1915, four generations, and we've seen the ups and downs and seen, you know, kind of what goes on. So yeah. it, 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 it is a, I wouldn't say it's a battle, but it is a battle for oil right now. And we're seeing with the Ukraine situation of, of what's happening is basically we're, we're coming out of something that we're having to rejuvenate, find more barrels of oil. And we need to continue drilling. Right. There's a lot of questions about energy independence and about the whole impact of that on just global economy, right? So, yeah. so uh, you, can't, you know, uh, we're going to discuss the price of gasoline, but can you talk about the price of oil and, and that relationship? And, and, you know, and also if you can at some point talk about oil and its relationship to petroleum products, not just gas, that'd be great. So, yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. And that's what everybody wants to know is, well, then we'll get to that in a minute. What about the summer? Where, where am I going to go for the summertime? Gasoline prices, where are they going to be? And I'll talk about that in just a minute. Everybody's like, should I take my trip from St. Louis to Branson, Missouri, or, or the Grand Canyon? Because you know, how much money am I going to have to need for gas? There so, you go, right? It's a big question, and, and I've been talking about this for the last couple of years because, you know, right before the pandemic, Russia and Saudi Arabia are fighting for our our dependence on oil. They don't want us to be, they want us to be dependent on them instead of us being the other way around. So what they did is they put a lot of oil in the market at very, very cheap prices right before the pandemic. This is December, January, 2020. They were putting all this oil in the market at real cheap discounts, 30, 40% discounts, because they wanted to flood our markets with oil. You, I remember that because of the fracking. Fracking was driving down prices. Drill, baby, drill. And so they said, great, we're going to match it and drive your frackers out of business. You're paying $1.80 at the pump. Man, everything's going good. But then all of a sudden, you know, and we're, we're producing over 14 million, almost 15 million barrels of oil a day in the United States. Saudi Arabia, Russia don't want that because then we don't need as much oil from them. So therefore, they put this cheap oil in the market. Then the pandemic happened. Bam, there goes our demand. So our demand goes way down. We're oversupplied with oil in the United States. Our demand goes way down. Prices go negative. But then the, the interesting thing about that, or I say interesting, extraordinary, really, because at that point, you're looking at a situation where, you know, we're not coming back. We're not drilling. You, you know, I, I, I just oil was what sixteen dollars a barrel back then. Well, you did. Yeah, minus forty seven at one one day. I remember going home for lunch and and I did my I was I was I said my my preacher on a podcast that afternoon and I was I was um, I was looking at the screen and I was catching him, Doctor Jack Graham out of uh, uh, Prestonwood in Dallas. But I I was interviewing him and I was sitting there and I I caught out of the corner of my eye that oil was minus twenty. And I've never seen a minus sign in front of the oil sign before, and it was very interesting. Yeah, was, I, I couldn't really catch my... And this was 18 months ago? Yeah, 18 months ago. <laughs> March, <laughs> April. Yeah. Well, no, it was, it was actually two years ago. Okay, two so years there, ago, yeah. 24 months. Yeah. yeah. So, yes, I mean, we are negative oil. Oil prices, and we got some of the statements in our March, April oil sales where literally... It's a minus sign. I mean, we like we we were receiving you know twenty thousand for a load. We get twenty thousand, twenty thousand, but all of a sudden there's a minus ten thousand, which means we were paying them to haul our oil. I mean, it's like it's like you know going to pay your rent at the apartment complex and they're giving you five hundred bucks instead of you paying them. They're crazy times. But what came out of that, Marty, basically was okay. Well, now. We're not coming back. Demand is going to come back. 
I mean, you know, we do drive cars, we do drive trucks, there's airplanes, there's all these different things. 50% of a barrel of oil is used for cars, trucks, and airplanes. The other 50% for, you know, this, plastics, lipstick, I mean, all the other product, asphalt or road. Beauty products. Beauty products. I mean, there's so many different things. Yep, yep. The demand's not going to go to zero, right? Doesn't matter what. It's not going to come back. But what happened was we were at 1,200 rigs drilling for oil and gas before the pandemic. 1,200 rigs. And you have to have rigs to drill for oil in order for oil to come out of the ground, in order for it to... Sure, sure. You know, we've got to have it. <clears throat> wells decline, and as wells decline, you've got to, you got to put that, those barrels back. So what happened was rigs were not coming back. So we were at... We were going from 1,200 rigs to 250, 300 rigs, we went down 75% of the rig count. Not, not, not 75 rigs, 75% of rigs went back in the yards of the companies that own them. And they weren't drilling for oil and gas. And so we're sitting there just thinking about it going, wow, why are they not drilling for oil and gas? <clears throat> well, there's no capital, right? The capital's drying up. The public, public markets are going, no, we don't want you to drill for oil and gas. We want to go green. And I've coined the term greener instead of green because we're not going to go green anytime soon. Greener, yes. We're, we're going to use electric cars, which is beautiful. We're going to use all these other methods, but we also need oil and gas. And it's just not coming back. So I've been talking for the last so, couple of so years. Six, wait, this is, yeah. this, again, let's just draw the picture. $16 a gallon, uh, a barrel, barrel of oil to be replaced by something else. Keep on going. And when should you invest? Right then, baby. And I was out there talking, talking about our fund. I was buying assets like no, no tomorrow. I'm, you know, pumped up about it. I'm buying deals. And everybody's like, good luck, you know, because, man, who wants to, you know, I'm like, Buy low, sell high. You know, you can only say that so many times. And I did many presentations. <laughs> but I was like, hey, this is the time. You know, 1950, my family's seen a few ups and downs in the oil and gas business. And, and uh, you know, it, it's, so it's not, anyway, so. Up yeah, and down. There's, blood in, there's blood in the streets. Exactly. exactly. And we, we, we cost some great, I mean, our fund right now is doing 10% just because of the, the things that we bought a long time ago. Not the new wells that we're going to drill. I mean, we, we raised a $50 million fund, $50 million in debt to drill oil and gas wells. And we're going to drill 15 to 20 wells with the initial capital. Every time we do, investors get money. But anyway, different, different times. But right now, we're seeing the demand start to come back and the rigs are not coming back. So supply is going down, demand's going up. What happens? What happens to the rigs? They, they wouldn't come back. Now, why wouldn't they come back? Good question is because the, the public companies aren't coming back. Exxon made $6 billion last quarter. They spent $10 billion buying back their stock. Why? Well, they've got a couple of people on their board that say, we don't want to drill for oil and gas. We don't want you to drill for oil and gas. Devon Energy, um, Alt Pioneer. Pioneer said, if oil goes to 200, we're not going to increase our rate count. So I, I think the right way to look at that, so just to, to give a higher level is that, there is a large number of uh, pension funds and uh, money managers who are for clean energy or green energy, yeah. let's say, and like CalPERS, uh, BlackRock, et cetera. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and they, because they own so much uh, equity stock in these large corporations that they have board seats and, mm -hmm. and, and they are able to determine, yes, we don't want you doing what you're doing. So, right, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Well, there's three reasons why the price of oil has gone up. Now, there's one big reason why it's gone up, and that's the reason because we're not drilling for oil and gas. But there's three reasons why we're not drilling for oil and gas, and that is your public companies, as you mentioned, or, or and we talked about in the institutions, they're not getting back, but also the government. The government's also shutting us down. Not necessarily the national government, but state governments. Wow. Okay. It's kind of like it's kind of like in Colorado. We have a we have assets and we have two in East Texas, two in the Permian in our, our funds, and one in Colorado, one in Wyoming. And I was talking to yesterday to the guys in Colorado, and I said, "Okay, let's get a rig, let's go." It's you know, hundred dollar for oil. Yeah. And they yeah. were like, they were like, "Okay, well, probably in six months." I'm like, "Okay, so in the East Texas project or West Texas, I can say, okay, guys, let's go. It's a hundred dollar oil.'" And they say, "Okay, we'll get a permit." We'll be at her next week, really. 
Sure, sure. I mean, it's the state in Colorado, Wyoming, is six months for a permit. Here, it's it takes so much longer in Colorado, Wyoming, where in, in Oklahoma, Kansas, Texas, it's a let's go, let's go tomorrow. Right. So I, I think in economics, there's something like price sensitivity analysis, mm -hmm. where like you know somewhere along a curve, people stop buying or start buying or start supplying or don't stop supplying. Right. So somehow that that sensitivity analysis is not working anymore. The market's been disrupted because oil was at $16 a barrel, and now it's at $116 a barrel. Right. So you think at some point that $100 journey that, that you know, trigger got triggered. So well, I mean, unless these companies are lying to us, like these companies saying, if oil goes to 200, Pioneer said this a couple of weeks ago, if oil goes to 200, we're gonna keep the rig count rate exactly where we are today. We're not gonna increase rig count. Wow, wow. So, and Exxon is doing the same thing. All the public companies are doing the same thing. Your big companies like Calipers, BlackRock, they were pouring hundreds of billions of dollars into the markets in 2012, 14, 16, because they wanted that return. So they were doing private equity debts. Now they're not, they're not doing that. So, they're finding alternatives. So what about Ukraine? Tell me, like, what's the impact of Russia, Ukraine? Yeah. Well, I, I was just reading uh, an article where a guy came back, a news reporter came back from Ukraine, he says, the war is over. Ukraine has been flattened. We should really, you know, reduce our losses, right? So, right. but uh, you know, what about that? I mean, there's a whole bunch of impact on right. oil and natural gas. So. Right, and that's something we haven't talked about. And we've seen the price of oil go up. You know, it, it had about twenty dollars premium. We talked about this right before the, the the war. We talked about you know it's going to go to one twenty if the Ukraine war if Russia does go into Ukraine. Well, it did, and it went to one twenty. Now it's coming down to a hundred, and you're going to see that. We're getting ready to find the bottom of supply and demand. As we talked about, we're not drilling. The numbers are there for us to, to um, we're not drilling for oil and gas. The rig count's down. We're not, we're not drilling. The, the U.S. oil production numbers are down. I mean, they're going up barely, but they're not coming up as, as much as they used to, or they need to be. <clears throat> so it is. So war is something in there, but we've already been there, done that. Now it's coming down. Now we're going to hit a bottom. And it's going to come back. What I'm afraid of is, is the price is going to hit a bottom and it's going to continue to go up, especially in the summertime when we need that, when we have that major demand, mm -hmm. major demand in the summertime. What do you, they're talking about reopening, <coughs> you know, connections with Venezuela. What do you think the impact of that would be? Oh, devastating. I mean, those guys over there, I mean, there, there is so much oil there, which would be awesome, but there is, it's just, it's just, I mean, you're dealing with, um, you know, people that you don't really trust. And it's going to take time. Even if we said, Okay, we're going to do that. It'll still take a year, two years. I don't know what happens in the back rooms of these governments and what President Biden's going to do next. I don't know that. I know this isn't talk about him either, yes or no. But I'm just saying that that. Um, but I, I did hear Marty that if you're going to if you did vote for Trump, you're going to pay two dollars at the pump, and if there's another, if you voted for Biden, you should pay ten dollars at the pump. Now I don't I don't know if it's in maybe we're in Austin, maybe that has. Um, going to affect you, but um, that's that's exactly what you should do. So, I mean, I, I'm of the belief that if things keep on, you know, fracturing with Russia and that oil goes, let's say, to India instead of to the West, that, you know, gasoline is going to go to $10 a gallon. But can you talk about, like, what, where you see gasoline pricing this summer and then, you know, longer term? Yeah. So given that, you know, this relationship with Russia is fracturing. Right, yeah. right. I can see the prices. We talked about this last night. You know, because I'm I'm not really that, you know, I say bullish about prices. I think it's good right now that it's coming down today. We're gonna we're gonna continue to come down until it finds the bottom. But then you're gonna see five dollar gas. You're gonna see six dollar gas by the summertime, only because of supply and demand. You're you're not gonna have the oil that you need in the summertime. And if everything works like it is right now, you're you're gonna have a shortage of oil in the United States because. We're not drilling for it, and nobody's really going back to work drilling for it. So you're going to see a shortage in the summertime, and you're going to see gas prices like you've never seen before. Right, 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 right. So, uh, and that's the main travel period when people drive a lot. Right. Uh, so you said that your family's been involved in oil and natural gas for several, more than 100 years. Can you talk about that a little bit? Right. Well, my great-grandfather was in the business, and um, he started in 1915, and just, just got in the business, and then um, had 12 kids. He was a really big guy, and then Grandma Birdie was a little little woman, and they lived and finished their life in Cahoma, Texas, 
and uh, we, we drilled wells just north of where they, they lived in their house, uh, in field house. But um, they had 12 kids. And if you're a man, you're in the old business. And if you're a woman, you're married to somebody in the old business, right? So you can imagine, you know, for, um, you know, during the summer times when everybody was getting together, what we talked about. I mean, the old field, right? I mean, that's kind of what, I don't know what everybody else talked about, but that's kind of the norm for us is we, we talked about the old field. And then when I was growing up, my grandfather allowed me to drive his, when I was tall enough to hit the pedals on his, in his truck. He had a three-speed, three-speed on the column. I don't know if they still make those or not, but we, uh, as soon as I was tall enough to drive, I was 12 or 13 or whatever, I had to be driving the old field. And so I'd go with him to the old field and just cool. talk to him about what was going on. And yeah, yeah. He put me to work. Okay, you, you've been in a business for a long time. Yeah. When did you start King Operating? So started King Operating in 96. I got out of school in 85 and uh, worked for other oil and gas companies and then started my own company in 96. Great, great. Yeah. And, and can you talk about like your properties and you know where they are and you know where you do the most drilling and things like that? Yeah. So what we did before was we would do a one well deal, you know, where I'd, I would I'd say, hey, Marty, let's go, let's go drill a well and it's a million dollars and and if you don't buy 10%, it's 100,000, give me 100,000. Yeah, yeah. We go drill a well and you would get oil out of that well or income out of that well for as long as it produced. And the wells were, you know, sometimes good, sometimes bad, but it was hard for you to really make any money. So what we did was I was on a chairlift with a, a friend of mine um, in um, Beaver Creek and he talks about the apartment business and what he does in the apartment business. And he's like, okay, hey, how I, this is how I do it. I do value add. I increase the value and either sell it or refinance it, give clients all their money back. Yeah, and sure. Then, yep, then yep. I, you know, and you know that game. Yep. And, and all your all your deals were structured that way. Mine wasn't at that time because I'd work for somebody else that they just put money together to go drill a well and it's either, you know, feast or famine. Hit, hit or miss, yeah. Yeah, find out what happens. So I, I came home that day uh, from my ski trip 2015. I thought, okay, hey, I'm going to do the same thing. So I had a rice guy and an SMU guy, and I said, hey, how do we structure this? What do we need to do to do this? So we started buying, we'd buy acreage and multiple places to go drill wells. So the first deal, we raised $6 million in 2015. We sold a third of it the next year for $24 million, or we got $8 million okay, nice. for our clients. Yeah, 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 $8 million for our clients. We put the rest of it in another fund and so forth. But that's kind of what we're doing. We're raising a $50 million in equity fund. We've got an East Texas um, property there, which is, you know, East Texas is a great place to go drill for oil and gas. We have two properties there. We have two, two in the, um, in West Texas, which is Howard County, and also the San Andres and the, uh, the other property. Uh, we also have a deal in Colorado and a deal in Wyoming. And our goal is to scale one of these six properties, uh, one out of six, really soon to sell it and give clients all their money back. Sure. You know, we've got our money in it too. And we don't, my wife wants her money back. Sure. It's amazing how, how that works, right? And my wife wants to go about three and a half million in it and she wants her money back. So that's my goal for our investors is to put together a fund, have multiple assets, not just a well or two or whatever, but have multiple assets in it. And then we go drill up these wells with the equity and some bank debt that we have. And then scale them up, and then sell one, and and produce the other ones. Right, right. So, so, and, and you talk about equity in the fund. How, what what kind of leverage do you use? What kind of you know bank loans, et cetera, do you use yeah. when you're doing this drilling and acquisition of wells? So right now we have about thirty five million that's raised in the fund, something like that. Uh -huh. And we have about, we have a seven and a half million dollar credit line. Okay. Okay. So we'll probably get to. I I, I can't see it getting then more than a forty to fifty million dollar line. Uh, with the with the with, and we have enough money right now to drill enough wells to have an exit. Yep, yep. So I don't think we'll have that much at all, especially in the initial stages where we have to give our clients the money back. That's my goal is to at the end of this year or or next year, if we don't have an exit, we still can give clients enough monthly revenue checks, thirty to fifty percent a year. We can do that and give clients their money back in two years without an exit. But if we have an exit before then. Then we can just, you know, refinance, continue to uh, to drill wells and give that monthly income. They, they like their tax benefits and they've always been intrigued with oil and gas, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of different deals out there. There's a lot of 
different type of deals out there. Are there any elements of fracking in what you're doing? I mean, are you doing horizontal wells or? Yeah, that's all we're doing is horizontal. The Wyoming properties will probably not need to be uh, fracked very much. Okay. The Colorado will, the uh, San Andres won't, the, the, the wells that we're getting ready to drill this summer, there's two wells there in Howard County and their wolf camp. We'll frack those. East Texas is, um, we'll frack those, but not, not as big a frack as what you always hear about with the Permian Basin and gotcha, and yeah. all that. But um, so we will. So you wrote a book. I did. I wrote a book. Tell me about it. Where's my book? Tom, you'll bring that down here so I can just show. Yeah, I wrote a book called The Upside of Oil and Gas Investing. It's, um, like, it, it, it's, 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 uh, show to the camera. Yeah. Perfect. So, um, it, it, Forbes published the book. And the reason, oh, are you asking me the reason why I wrote it? You can, you can get the reason. Oh, do you mind? No, no. I was, I'm just kidding. Sorry. Sorry. But anyway, so, um, um, but I wrote, I, it's the upside of oil and gas. It's a family history of, of my family and what we've done and how we've done it. And, and um, also I'm the first one in my family that's been an entrepreneur that's gone out on their own, you know, uh, good or bad. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, this whole <laughs> business. But anyway, so it's the upside of oil and gas investing, and Forbes uh, Forbes published it. And the reason why I wanted I wanted to write the book, and the reason why I wanted Forbes in here was because hey, there's a lot of deals out there, a lot of deals out there, a lot of good deals, a lot of bad deals. Hey, and and if you go to Upside Oil and Gas, UpsideOG.com, I'll send you a free autographed copy. I've got a few books here, but I'll send you a free autographed copy. Just go to UpsideOG.com for all your listeners. I, I was going to say this once or twice. I can, but, I'm going to type it in. It's okay. Upside. UpsideOG.com. UpsideOG.com. Okay. And go in there, fill out the assessment, and I'll send you a free autographed copy of the book um, about this. But this, the, the David David Moore, who manages probably 30, 35,000 doors here uh, in, the, in the apartment business, he, he's on the back, and a good friend of mine lives in my neighborhood, one of our best investors. Um, but it, it just talks about, you know, what kind of deals are out there? How can you, I made mistakes. I mean, I know, I know, Mark, it's, it's hard to believe. It's There's very hard to lot, believe. A lot of great people <laughs> here. No, but, man. <laughs> but, but, you know, the, 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 how you structure the deal is so important in the only gas, you know. Each one of our assets that we buy has the scalability of being huge, two, three hundred million, four hundred million. Each one of them, and and not all of them are going to do it. Some of them are just going to drill and produce and send out revenue checks. But we have every one of them has the opportunity to come in here and and scale and exit, because it doesn't matter. You hear about all the people that made money in oil and gas. Yeah, well, they exited at one time. Something, you know. So yeah. you've got to do that. And I talk about that in the book. I talk about what's the best way to get involved in the oil and gas business. What's the best way for you to, to find somebody that you can trust in the oil and gas business. And there's no guarantees in the business and there is huge ups and downs, but at the, at the end of the day, you know, you find somebody that has good assets, that has a good team, that has the right deal structure that you can go in and scale it, scale it and sell it. We have a, we have our face mask. Uh, I, I actually, I've trademarked that scale it and sell it. And um, works for me, yeah. Hey, man, why not, right? I have people in Silicon Valley do this all the time. So, so upside, OG, can you get it on Amazon as well? I don't want to give Amazon any props, but uh, yep. Um, you can go on um, Apple, you can go on um, Amazon, you can go anywhere. And what about up. what about your podcast? I mean, I know you do it on. I mean, all your TV appearances. You right. have a YouTube channel, or is there something going on there? I do, I do, I do, and I'm upgrading my YouTube. I'm upgrading my podcast right now. We've gone through. Uh, um, a lot of different things with this Ukraine situation, and man, it's been really crazy. But I want to, I want to be more specific in my message. And a lot of people that we do, I do interview. I ask them different questions because I, I love it when people want to learn about oil and gas, but also love to interview smart people like you and find out more about you. Hey, who should I be talking to? How, how did how did you become successful? What's the biggest mistake you ever made? You know. All those kind of questions I like to ask on my podcast because, you know, that, that, you know, when you're 16 to 20 years old, you're making decisions then. What should I do? Should I go over here and go with my friends and, and do this over here? Or should I go back to class like my mom wanted me to do? Or, or 
what should I do in those turning points? So it, so it, and, and we're not educated about that when we go to school. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Um, so we, we, we learn something. I'm not sure what it is, but yeah. 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 But this is really fantastic. And so what what caused you to write this book? Yeah. And, and what are the central topics you're dealing with? Yeah. Um, so the family offices out there, the, the the broker dealers, the RAs and people like that. I wanted them to know, hey, you know what? There's this guy in Dallas, Jay Young, who wrote a book because he has such a fascination about the business, but also a knowledge about, hey, you know what? You all know, put this in your due diligence file right here because, man, I've been there, done that. I love this business and I want people to make money and I want people to know that what I do know and what I don't know, right? Sometimes you, you don't know what you don't know, right? And so I want to know that, hey, you know what, we've been there, done that. And I wanted people to know that, hey, you know what, this is the, we're, we're, we've, we've got great assets, the best assets of anybody in this business that, that is, and the idea of owning six different assets in one fund. I mean, extraordinary. I mean, Lone Star funds and these big, huge funds do this. I've been, I've, I was the owner of the Texas Rangers back um, when the Nolan Ryan was in there. I was a small investor, but, you know, I, I had a lot of people there. Ray Davis, Bob Simpson, um, Neil, uh, um, uh, Billy, Billy Quinn, uh, Ken Hurst. I learned a lot from these people. That's the only reason why I'm a baseball fan, but not as big a baseball fan as as a lot of other people, but I'm a people. I want to learn. I want to be a sponge. I want to ask questions and and find out, you know, the best answers that I can. Sure. And that's how I, that's why I wrote the book because I'd done enough research to find out what's the best way for clients to make money. You know, not just not 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 us as a promoter. You know, man, that's that's selfish. And and there are there are a lot of promoters out there that will never admit they want to make money. But there's a lot of promoters out there that have no clue, zero, on how does the client make money. Yeah, yeah. And so, so, so how many funds have you raised so far? Is this like your first fund or your fifth fund? Or yeah, we did. We did the Scurry County project I was telling you about with a track record of uh, the six to eight million, one hundred thirty percent a year. Wow. And, and then we did a Howard County project, which we're drilling a couple of wells in it right now. And then this is our third fund, which is our King Operating Partners One fund that has multiple. This is the first one that we've had multiple assets in multiple areas. Does your fund have like pass-through tax benefits, you know? Yeah, we do have 100% tax write-off. So people in California, especially, they love seven, paying seven dollars for gas, gasoline. No, just kidding. But they 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 love the tax write-offs because it's, this affords them 100% tax write-off, and you, you know you get that you get that monthly income. So, um, so we've had lots of funds presented to our group in the oil and gas, and I'll tell you that some of them have really spectacular write-ups. And then when you get to the terms, it's like putting a rock on a note and throwing it down into the ocean or something like that. Um, so terms can really kill a deal. Uh, so talk about how your fund is different than other funds that are out there and uh, what makes it you know, something that more desirable than yeah. what we're seeing already from other people. Right, good, thank you. Yeah, there, there's a lot of people out there too that, that when you invest with them, all you're investing in is like there's the big BD space. They, they raise $100 million a year. And all they're doing is drilling, you know, 20, 30 wells inside a fund. There is no upside. I was I was sitting next to, when I wrote the book, there was a fellow author that's an RA out of um, Ohio. And I was talking to him. And I said, and, and I said, you know what? I said, you're my perfect client. Because they, they had talked about you know, network with your people at your, at your um, table. And I said, you're my perfect client. And he said, why? And I said, well, because you're an RA and you have multiple people that have, you know, need write-offs and need, you know, so-and-so. And he said, oh yeah. He goes, I use X, X, you know, uh, fund. And I said, oh, okay. And I knew them very well. And I said, uh, just out of curiosity, why do you use them? And he said, well, he said, because, you know, each year he said, I give them, you know, four or five million dollars. And he said, from all my aggregate of all my clients. And he said, what they do is they they give them, you know, 100% write-off and they'll give them monthly income. And he said, after you know, five to seven years, he said they'll get their money back. So it's it's not a loss, you know. And he said, I said, so how do they do it? And he said, Well, he said, they'll take in the hundred million dollars they raise every year. And he said, they will go and they will drill all these wells and though and i said and they're proving up acreage 
not for you. They're proving up acreage for them. And um, but anyway, so I said, he said they'll drill 15 to 20 wells and there's no dry holes, maybe one or two little stinkers. But he said, you know, he said, you know, money back. And I said, well, so where's the upside of that? Is there any upside? And he said, that's when I, that's when I, that's when I said, no, we're going with the upside of oil and gas investing. There right there. And I said, uh, is there any upside? He goes, what do you mean? And I said, well, I said, there is no upside. There is no scalability. There is no exit. And he goes, no, no. We just, I give them money and they go drill wells. And so ours is different to where from day one, I'm looking to scale it and sell it. I'm looking to each, each one of our six assets that we have. I'm looking to scale each one of those and scale one of them, two of them, whatever it takes to get the clients their money back. Because I feel like that if I you give me a hundred thousand and I take your hundred thousand dollars and you get monthly income from all the wells that are producing right now, then all of a sudden, if I can give you all your money back and I can still continue sending you revenue checks in the future. Yep. Yep. I mean, you'd be pretty good friends. What's the minimum investment on this? So we have uh, $200,000 positions. Um, and we have some people that take a 50,000, mm -hmm. some people take a hundred, some people like me, I'm the biggest investor in the fund at three and a half million. And we have some other investors at $2 million. million. Mm -hmm. And uh, like, uh, is it for accredited investors, qualified investors? Accredited investors only. Okay. Right. Okay. Right. Is there a limit when you create a fund like this and how many investors you can have in the funds? Not that I know of. Um, not, not that we uh, are, are aware of that we're concerned with. Yeah. yeah. Because of the accredited investors. Sure. I really can't think of anything more important than energy right now. I mean, it's not only is it petroleum used in many products and it's used for gasoline, but it's also essential in manufacturing, yeah. right? So for the U.S. to have manufacturing parity with other countries, we need to make sure we've got inexpensive energy, right? right. So, so well, if you're going greener, you know, as I mentioned, the, the word term, I coined the term greener. When I say coined, I'm not sure if anybody really knows or cares about that, but, you know, coined it, meaning that we're not going to go green anytime soon. So we are going to need oil. And I mean, I know there's one or two Teslas, probably in this room, one or two people probably drove a Tesla today, which is awesome, but that's one. Okay. So how many are out there on the road right now? And how many do you see per, you know, hundred and they're going to take over everything. And even if they did, we need 20 million barrels a day in the United States. That's our appetite. That's how much oil we need. And if every car was electric or you didn't drive them tomorrow, everyone, we still need 10 million barrels. Right, right, right. In the United States, and we're only producing 12. So we would have more oil than we, we would consume at that time. But that's, you know, what are the odds? Not very good that we're going to go. So it's almost like having a base load. Like the base load of oil is 10 million barrels. Right. Wow. We'll still meet. That's our demand. And it'll go up as population goes. It will continue to go up. Yeah, there you go. Fantastic. Oh, we have a question. A couple of uh, questions. Yeah, who's your buyer you know, on the exit? Who, or who do you think your buyer is going to be? Yeah, so we have um, multiple. Uh, we'll, we'll go through an A and D process, and we'll look at it for public companies. Our, our goal is to start with $25 million in equity and have 60 locations. Drill 20 wells that's worth three to four hundred million dollars. And that's a public company. Public companies always want production and they also want the puds, the two wells on each side. We don't drill those. All we drill is that one well in the middle, leave two puds on each side. So we turn to them 20 and 40. So they love production and they want 40 drill sites to drill in the future. That's public public companies. And there's a thousand public companies out there. And our East Texas stuff, they're all over and they're hungry. You know. Uh, another question, Ron? Yes. What, what does this imply in terms of our relationship with Canada and how much do we import there and are they uh, ready to start pumping? Yeah. Good, good, good thought. They are one of our best uh, people that we buy crude from right now. And those are what people talked about with the uh, Keystone Pipeline, you know, if, if we would have allowed that or if that would have been one of the, the things that Trump wanted, maybe Trump should have said, I don't want it. Then Biden would have said, yes, let's do it. But <laughs> then, then that heavy crude that's coming out of Canada would, would continue, would be flowing today because that Keystone pipeline would have brought like 800,000 barrels a day out of Canada to the United States. Obviously it didn't go. And then that 700,000 barrels with Russia wouldn't have been such a huge challenge or problem as it is right now. 
So Canada is important and will continue. Can it but, just be rail? No. Not it's, not, it's not as easy to rail as, as it is pipelines. Right. Pipelines are, are easy or obviously. But a guy like Warren Buffett will make more money than his railroad shipping the oil than on the pipeline. That's the reason, probably the reason why he's a Biden supporter. Because uh, we are we are railing. I wonder yeah. what the economics are of that. Yeah. In terms of price. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's like it's like um if you if you uh, don't rail it, it's like you know 20. If it, if you do, it's like but what you're gonna rail is is 10, piping is five or something. So it's still it's still a good thought. It's still money's out there and money needs it, and and we need the rails and rails, we are working the rail railing system, but just not for the not for the oil that they wanted to out of Canada, and that's why we lost that eight hundred thousand barrels. Uh, you know, one, one of my 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 partner questions: Can you talk about the different quality of the different oil that we get? Like the you know, my understanding of Canadian oil is that a lot of it's kind of dirty, and you know, yeah. especially the West Canadian oil, oil might have more bitumen in it. Is that what it's called? And and then you know the that's uh, a good word. Yeah, I'm, I'm learning. Venezuelan oil is uh, you know a little bit you know different than the American oil. So can you talk about that as well? Yeah, so you need a blend of oil that that, that works in these refineries that you have. So at, at one point we were producing so much oil that we were importing. We are exporting. We had to export oil because I remember that. Yeah, we we didn't have we didn't have the refineries necessary to be able to blend it up and, and that because, wasn't too long ago. Yeah, no, it was. That's, <laughs> during Trump. Drill, baby, drill, and uh, now we're in a different situation. Um, but so, like, um, like oil that comes out of um, of Russia or Canada, some of these dirtier oils, you need that for asphalt, right? All the all that stuff you need because you can't buy oil that were produced in the St. Andrews project. That is a that's a little bit lesser crude rating than it is when you, when it comes out of like the Howard County project. On the east side of the Permian Basin, yeah, it's such a different blend, and that blend is what you know you need to make different types of oil. Like gasoline is, is Howard County, the, the Canadian oil things you can't make that into gasoline. Doesn't help with gasoline, but it does help with asphalt. It helps us with um, other types of probably not plastics. I'm trying to think of all the different, you know, I've, um, <laughs> what's that? Rubber. Yeah, rubber, right, right. Oh, everything, right? Yeah. So you need a different type of crude for each one, and mm -hmm. um, just and that's 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 what that's what's wrong with the blend. Yeah. Right, right. And and you have only refineries that are set up for certain types of oil, and when when you have so much oil coming out of the Permian Basin that is great gravity crude, then at that point you say, okay, well we have enough of this, let's let's ship it. So they you start shipping it. Right, yeah, I think there's like a catches everywhere. So I'm not sure if petroleum is used in pr production of plastic and plastic bags, but I mean, obviously we switch to paper bags to cut down trees, but you need energy to cut down trees as well. So, right. and to ship them, right? So, so, you know, it's always this equation that we're trying to balance. So, so fantastic. Any other questions, folks? Was there anything online or was there somebody online? Uh, no, I don't think so. No, no, I think we're pretty good. So, uh, oh, one more question from Ron. Uh, in terms of um, you know, carbon and, and turning fusion carbon into oil, are you also making a bet on that in terms of being able to get extracted even more efficiently? Uh, so, you're talking about like uh, carbon capture? Yeah, carbon capture and use of carbon capture into the production of oil because you can actually you know, push it down the well and get. More or less of the uh, some of the older wells. Right. So the carbon. Okay, I got you. So, so you, know, you can take some of the skin out of Wyoming, you know, the, um, the, the stuff that they're putting out in the air, take that carbon and put it through a solvent and then pump it back into the wells and get more or less of it and, and create a carbon. Right. That is, and I don't, I don't, I'm not 100% on that story. I know that. that 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 is a that is a type of uh, it's like water flooding or like there's all these different second secondary uh, type of pro projects that you can do to get different ways of getting oil out of the ground. You know, it's like you can push water down the ground like we would in St. Andrews formation, and you want to make sure that you produce enough St. Andrews water and you just recycle it, and it does. Well, out in Colorado, we do the same thing there. We produce three thousand three thousand barrels of water a day. 
if you don't produce the water, you're not going to produce the oil. And they're doing the same thing right now with, with, with gasoline um, or, or the gas, natural gas that comes out of these wells because they don't want to flare it and let it go out in the atmosphere. They want to make sure that they put it back down into the ground. And it's, it's a, like with the project we just finished up in um, North Texas, we're using that gas to re-inject it for our secondary or try to get you know wells going, same thing. Yeah. I'll tell you the biggest biggest thing I, I the, the biggest success story is the the, the guys, the 19-year-old guys from uh, AM right now, they're they're bitcoining it. You know, yeah. so they've got all this Bitcoin and there was something in article that I think 20 people sent me the article about they were talking about and I don't know how this works, but we're getting ready to work on it and have one of our have it come out to one of our wells because if you come out and you have a well that's so far outside and it's going to produce oil, you can truck the oil, but you can't truck the gas. And if it's doing gas and if you're flaring it like you know we used to, I mean my, my grandfather would tell me that he had there was so much gas that he would walk around in the oil field and you'd see the ants, you know, at at night because there was so much gas and it just went in the atmosphere, but that's just the way they produced the wells at that time. But today, it's you hook it up and go by there on the, on the tank and, and get the oil, but the gas is just flared. Well, you put that into this Bitcoin mining that you mine the Bitcoins right there on location. So they bring out this big, huge storage tank. So they use the gas for the energy? Yeah. Uh, yeah. To to generate the bitcoins, the gas that flares, yeah. To generate the energy to run the bitcoin uh, mining. Mining, yeah, that's facility. Clever. So that's actually a good. Uh, we got another question in the audience. Uh, it's, it's not uncommon. I'm sure, you talk about this. That's right. I wasn't about my hair. Oh, yeah. Economics of that. We're flaring about 500 mpg. Apparently, one of these sites, I guess, mm -hmm. to your point, one of these self storage things needs about 300. I'm going to get any macro thoughts on what the economics of that. Oh my gosh! Man, they were at one time during the during the crazy times of the. I I don't know necessarily the economics of bitcoins and what that would do to the bitcoin situation, but I know one time. I mean, you go out to West Texas and you just see flaring everywhere. I mean, it was crazy. They don't do as much now. I mean, but I don't know what they're doing with that gas. Um, but it, I don't. From my understanding, are you talking about the, the economics on the Bitcoin I mean, from an like operator on standpoint? On our gas production side, I mean, yeah. it's, you know, it's obviously better to give it to somebody who's going to pay for it. Yeah, to they just flare it and let it be done, right? Uh -huh. You've got to flare the gas because you've got to produce the oil, right? And that's the reason why they were they were flaring so much oil or gas in, in uh, I can't like 18, 18 million, 50 million or something like that a day in West Texas or 200 million or something crazy. But they're they're coming back to the bitcoins. But I'd I'd like to know more about that. But as as if I can define what that means in a storage tank, bringing over to manufacture bitcoins, that's about as far as I go. I mean, I mean, if you ask me one more question deeper than that, man, I'm gonna have to. I a whole other. So at least I need a glass of water. Go back, go back to college or something, <laughs> right? So yeah. yeah. With the two with the. Yeah, I think there's an MIT six week course you can take online. I mean, well, I'm going to Bitcoin 2022. I'm going out. I'm going to that Bitcoin 2022. My understanding is that the largest Bitcoin miner in the country is here in Texas. There, as a matter of fact, I, I was talking to the guy on the phone last week. He told me that he sold his original Bitcoin mining company last year, and now he's building something four times bigger, all out of West Texas. Wow! Wow! Now they're using all of the wind energy there to do it. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So. How do you really measure mentioned. Bitcoin and how much, how many Bitcoins there are? And you know, you know. all I know is 25% of them are lost. Yeah. So, <laughs> and there's a guy in jail who owns about uh, $8 billion worth of uh, Bitcoin, who's a Texas guy, University oh, of really? Austin, PhD. Wants to oh, 